Let the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconcile Joyful all the nations rise Join the triumph of the skies decorated have you decorated your houses yet have you started decorating you know we decorated last week for the sanctuary and I was had some extra lights and I told Patty I said you know what there's a Bible verse that goes with being the light and I want to share that with you and it's found in Matthew chapter 15 Verse number 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so I was thinking, I have some lights. Should I just wear these around town and let my light shine? Do you do, you do it? <laughs> is that a challenge? <laughs> is, that a, is that a dare? Uh what are lights good for? Christmas trees. Christmas trees. What else is what else is light? What else are lights good for? Plants, because it helps them grow. Anything else? Does anyone here sleep with a light on? Okay, so your aunt sleeps with Christmas lights on. Does anyone sleep with a night light? Okay. You do? Okay. Why do you want a night light? Because it's too dark in the night. Okay. If it burns out, you're scared, okay? So here's the deal. Why does what good does light do? It helps drive away the darkness, doesn't it? And Jesus, what Jesus says, he goes, I want you to be the light of the world. I want you to be light for the community. I want you to be able to share that Jesus loves you. Uh, how you're playing with leave my lights alone, okay? All right. But you know lights they would be pretty ridiculous. If you saw me in Walmart dressed like this, what would you do? 
laugh, okay? Would you be afraid? No, okay? Some people, I'd be kind of afraid if I saw someone dressed like this, like that person is odd, okay? But uh, I want you to remember, we're, we're supposed to be light to the community. How are we supposed to be light? He says, with your good works. So even though I have lights on, really what he's saying is when you do good things, it points people to Jesus. So make sure that you do that and brings them joy. So today's, how many of you know what today's candle is? It's number two. That is an excellent, excellent. That is the, that's the best answer we're going to have today. What's the other candle? Does anyone? Okay. What's the candle I'm supposed to light today? What is it? Okay. We are going to light joy. We, were, we debate this every year, and uh, Kathy actually wrote on her calendar for next year, so we give them in the right order. But joy is actually the third candle. But we're going to do joy today because we had already printed up the bulletins. Uh, is that a good reason? What is joy? Loving, caring. What does joy mean? Do you have joy right now? Why? Okay, it's kind of like being happy. However, being happy usually is depending upon something's happened that you uh, that makes you kind of feel good. But joy, you can have it. I asked Fred this morning, I said, what's a good verse for joy? And he says, in your troubles, I will, you know, he will have, I'm like, okay, we don't want to be, you know, um, too down today. But you know what? Joy, I want to read a verse with I found for you. And this is in John 15, verse 10 and 11. He basically, in verse 10, Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you'll be a child of mine. And then in verse 11 it says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. We want to have joy in our lives, and that's like peace and happiness and knowing that God loves us and excitement um, and just having that all the time. Even when we're having struggles, we can still have joy in our heart. So as we do the holiday season and we think about this candle, the candle is joy. Be joyous. Okay, let's pray. Father, I just thank you that you came so that our joy can be complete. And even when we go through struggles, we can still have that inner joy, Lord, that we know that you are uh, working and that you're alive and that you have things under control. Father, I also pray that we can be the light of this community. Father, help us to shine for you. Father, I just thank you for these boys and girls and just ask you to pour out your blessings upon them. For its name in Jesus we pray, amen. Reminder how much we really appreciate our children church workers. Obviously, it's very much appreciated by our children. Um, I appreciate Ted's children's time because I think it's just a revelation. You know, one of the hardest things about sharing your faith is how to get the conversation going. All you got to do is put lights all around your head and <laughs> walk into Walmart. I bet you people will start bringing up conversations to you. Why are you doing that? Let me tell you about being the light of the world. I have a couple announcements before we, uh, uh, we begin this morning. First of all, I think Ted already mentioned to you that we are not having the twice-fed part of Bible study this morning or this evening at 5.30. We're meeting in here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock. Uh, for Bible study, we're going to give Freddie kind of a little bit of a break um, from cooking in the kitchen like he does so faithfully all year long. Um, but we are still having Bible study, so I look forward to seeing you at 6 o'clock in here. Um, but then the other announcement um, is a uh, happy one that I want to give you from uh, Darren Fowler. Uh, once again, we appreciate Bill last week stepping in for Darren, who was stepping in for Mike. Um, uh, for our... Yeah. <laughs> 
for our praise team uh, last week. Uh, but uh, Darren uh, wanted to be sure that you knew the straight story because he said when he was giving the story of what was going on, him, uh, on with him before, um, half of what he was telling us was through drugs <laughs> because they were, uh, they were doping him up pretty much because of pain. He never did have an appendectomy. Um, um, we thought he was having an emergency appendectomy. He wasn't. He was having his, uh, ap his appendix did, was leaking and all kinds of stuff, but they found out it's actually attached to other parts of his body to where they could not take it out without taking out other parts of his body. Um, so um, all they did was they uh, drained it and cleaned out the infection that was going on because it was leaking. And he wanted to give a huge kudos to Winslow uh, Little Colorado Medical Center. Um, because he said they did exactly, he went to Banner in Phoenix and the guy and the surgeon and Banner said Winslow did exactly what I would have done. Uh, probably saved your life. And Darren even wanted to go as far as saying, and the nurses in Winslow, is Lori with us this evening or this morning? No? Okay, Lou, you're going to have to tell Lori for us. He said the nurses in Winslow are just so much more refreshing than the nurses in Phoenix. He's like, man, the nurses in Phoenix, I had to like practically chase them down the hallway to get some attention uh, for I needed my pain medication or I needed to just use the restroom. And they always acted pretty put out whenever I needed something. But the nurses in Winslow, man, they would just, uh, they were just going over backwards to be sure I was comfortable and had my needs met. So he wanted you to know that. And he says, thank you for praying for him. He's well on the mend, uh, he's home. Um, and so we're just really grateful that God has watched over. Yeah, yeah. And I thank you for clapping because he's going to try to watch Facebook today as long as everything's working. So he, he heard your appreciation. Um, today's a very special Sunday that we have uh, every year. Is, uh, this is Deacon uh, selection. We are voting on uh, somebody that you nominated as a deacon. Uh, so as if I can give a quick announcement before I bring Jim McLean up here, um, uh, we, if hopefully you picked up a ballot, if you are a member of our church, hopefully you picked up a ballot in the foyer. If you haven't, be sure to uh, maybe slip out and grab one really quick. Um, and you're going to put it in the red box that John Stevenson, where's John? Oh, they're right in front of me. <laughs> um, John's going to be standing back there with a red box. That's where you put your ballot. Uh, you have to put your name on the ballot so that we can uh, be sure that you're a voting member of our church. Um, if you ever wonder, why bother becoming a church member? Well, this is one of the times where it matters because we want our voting membership to choose um, who your deacons are. Um, but we decided a few years ago, um, using Jeff Dixon as a guinea pig, um, to uh, interview our deacon so that you can, our not, uh, potential deacon, so that you can know who it is that you're voting on. And uh, many of you already know Jim. He has been around our community for a long time. I mean, he uh, retired from our school system after working there as a teacher and as a principal for our junior high. Some of you might have even had him in one of those capacities. I had him uh, when he was pretty fresh out of college as a math teacher. And uh, I am the brilliant math mind today, all because of <laughs> Jim McClain. Um, actually, without exaggeration, I'm not the brilliant math mind, but I started liking math because of your class. You did a good job, yeah. And then uh, you know that he is now our newest uh, city council uh, member, uh, just got elected. And he has been part of our church and a Bible study teacher as part of our church for longer than I've been here. And, uh, as pastor, and Jen and I have been here for like over 15 years now. So he's been very active in this church body for a while. And so we're excited that we have this opportunity to uh, interview him so you get to know a little bit about more about Jim, hear a little bit of his testimony and some of the questions that I'm going to be asking him. He's not particularly excited about this part of it. I don't know very many people that really enjoy my happy little hot seat, um, but I always appreciate um, getting a chance for you to know the people up here. So Jim, if you can come on up and have a seat on the stool and let's chat in front of all of our closest friends. A little bit about what God's done in your life, what God is doing in your life, and uh, all that kind of good stuff. I don't know. Is it working? You want me to? I was saying the same thing. How come he gets tired? Yeah, he gets tired. 
<laughs> oh, is that the high chair? Or is that the higher chair? It just got turned into the high chair. <laughs> all right, all right, that's good. I guess we don't need this if we got to. All right, Jim, why don't we start out um, by praying for us? How about we do that? That sounds awesome. like a good idea. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. God, thank you for Jim. Thank you for Lisa. Uh, thank you for their continuing legacy and the way that you're using them in our community. Thank you for the continuing legacy through his kids. I mean, we uh, really appreciate everything that Mike and Brandy are doing as part of us. And, uh, and God, I just pray that you direct us this morning. I mean, we all love Jim. Most of us know Jim. Uh, but really, you're the one building the church. You're the one that has to give us our ministry. And so, God, um, if this is something that's from you, um, I pray that everything goes smoothly. I pray that everybody make the decision accordingly. Um, if this is something that you're saying, well, not right now, well, we pray that we know that. We just trust you because um, you're building the church. We're just trying to be faithful stewards. Now, God, I pray for our conversation we're about to have. I pray, God, that it be encouraging to other people as they listen to what you've done through this one man and his family. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, Jim, why don't you start out by telling us a little bit of your testimony, you know, your, your life with Christ. Well, this could, this could be pretty boring for most of you. Um, because uh, when I was little, when I was born, immediately my, I was in, uh, born into a church-going family. And so uh, my grandparents were pillars of the church, and uh, my parents went to the church and were involved, and so... From when I was born, I was in the church every, every Sunday. And uh, it was the church right down the street. At that time, it was called First Christian Church. Um, so, um, and it was, a, it was a great place yeah. to grow up. Because um, <clears throat> I don't know how you guys do. Um, how many of you were raised? Yeah, you're going to have to raise your hand, please. <laughs> have to participate. How many of you were raised like that? You went to Sunday school. You were raised in the church. Oh, okay, good. So about, what, a third? I died? Does that mean bird? Oh, I don't know. All of a sudden, it just clicked off. Let's try that again. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> I didn't touch it. You guys saw me. <laughs> oh, okay, it's acting up. Sorry, you're going to have to hold something. All right. For Christmas, anybody can invest in <laughs> and some. <laughs> Is this one on? Yeah, there you <laughs> go. Okay. So if you guys are like me, when you grew up in the church, there's no, a lot of you, when you have a conversion experience, you have a great story to tell. It's gripping. And uh, when you grow up in the church, it's kind of, it's, it's different, I think. And, it, and for me, I just want to, uh, right now, praise all the people, all those mainly ladies that were faithful in teaching Sunday school. Because by the time I was three, four, five, six, man, this, this thing was real. And uh, it was those uh, faithful people that did it. And, you know, I can name a ton of names of, of those people. And uh, I don't know if you guys are going to like this next part or not, but Brandy, go ahead. That is my sixth grade Sunday school class. And if you look at the sign behind us, you might be able to tell it is the church down there. And my teacher that year was, was uh, Mrs. Lancaster. And there were so many ladies like her. And uh, I don't know why it was usually the ladies who taught Sunday school, but it, but it was. And a lot of the men at that time worked on the railroad, so they were out a lot. But I had people like uh, Virginia Graft and Verna Welch and Geraldine Bates and Dorothy West. And I mean... They, came, they made things come to life for you. They taught on what was called the flannel graph. 
<laughs> okay, some of you know. It was amazing. Lazarus went into the tomb and disappeared, and then Jesus came like this, and then he came out. It was like, whoa. <laughs> and the kids nowadays would be like, this is so boring. <laughs> Oh, man, I love flannel graphs, flannel graphs. <laughs> Where's the effects, right? <laughs> but, you know, it meant something to me. Um, and you probably can't pick me out in that picture because I've changed so much. <laughs> now, I don't know if you think you're loving the hairstyle or, or if you're loving the glasses, but that shirt, I'm rocking that shirt. <laughs> um, so, so I grew up in the church, and, and I knew Jesus. And some of you are going to say, oh, no. But I was baptized at seven years old. And some of you are going to say, oh, that's too young. And I'm going to be like, you know, I could have been baptized probably at age four or five, I think, because of the great job that that church family um, did, did for me. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, I got baptized. I'm living my life. Then you get to junior high and high school. And you're on this certain level, and sometimes you start looking for yourself or for satisfaction or for approval in different areas. And so I kind of flatlined for a long time, spiritually. I still knew all the Bible stories, and, and thank God for youth group. Oh my gosh, youth group. Um, if your kid's not in youth group or whatever, you know, get your kid into a youth group. Help them find a, a peer group. And Christian friends, you know, help them grow together because those relationships are critical. Well, then I get through high school. I'm trying to be a jock, and most of you are around know I, I was trying, but I wasn't. Yeah. And, and so I'm like, I had a group of friends. We weren't bad kids, but we weren't Christian kids either. We just kind of there. Then something happened. Next slide. <laughs> so Lisa and I met, and it's kind of crazy. She was raised in a different church background. Um, she was raised LDS. I'm at this independent Christian church, but right away I mean it was it was almost immediate we were like hey and so we started having we're only 17 and 18 year olds but we're having some converse, some really important conversations about who is Christ what is our future going to be and then we feel we figured out right away we cannot keep this relationship unless we figure out how our faith and how Jesus is that was, that was crazy. I couldn't believe we were talking about it. So that's our ju junior year. So next slide. So then we matured. See? Hey. <laughs> How you like those sideburns? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess, never mind. <laughs> so we started to get serious, and, and I went off to college. Um, next one, please. And we decided that's our engagement picture. Look at that hair. Ooh. <laughs> and notice, I went from the big glass, black glasses to the Coke bottle ones. Is that cool or what? <laughs> uh, you go to the big city, you get other choices. <laughs> and so that's our engagement photo. And we had decided we are going to raise our family for Christ. We're going to live for Christ. And we started to attend, go ahead, Brandy. We started to attend some uh, things to help us get ready for that. And uh, I don't remember who it was, but they gave us this little triangle. And I was like, man, that makes sense. So if the husband is down on the one corner and the wife is down on the other corner, and they said, as you grow closer to God, whether your wife glows closer to God or not, you still get closer to her. You guys see how that works? I was like, amazing. Hmm. Or the opposite. If the wife is growing, but the husband isn't, you know what? The wife's getting closer to God, but also getting closer to the husband. And if they both grow closer to God together, what's happening to their relationship? You see it? I'm like, wow, that's amazing. 
What a simple thing, right? Mm. So, sorry for all these pictures, Fred. No, that's good stuff. <laughs> but in any relationship you have, if you grow closer to God, that person you're in that relationship grows closer to God too. Whether it's a father, son, a daughter, mother, father, mother, grandchild, you know, your friends at work. If you're growing in your walk, you're helping them get closer to God too. And that's what this church everybody does for us and the relationships we have in this church. And that's what Lisa's relationship did for me. I, I broke out of my lethargic Christian attitude and Lisa and I really started to grow together. Next one. And then we got married. <laughs> Next one. And so this scripture became so important to Lisa and I. I th is it familiar to all of you? Choose. That's choose, but for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And Lisa, if you come into our house today, you'll see that it's right across the top to help remind us. But um, I can't thank God enough because without Lisa, I have no idea how my life would have gone. No idea whatsoever. It was that relationship. So the church relationship, then this relationship. Next one, Lisa. Next one, Brandy. Then we had kids. And you know what? Um, their relationships did nothing but make us grow closer and closer as a family. And I had uh, the joy of baptizing both of my kids. Mm. And that was the only water picture I could find. So it <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought baptism, water, you know. <laughs> But our relationship with our kids just took us further and further closer to God. And I'm not saying that life goes like this, but hopefully your walk with the Lord, if you drew a line through there, through those ups and downs, hopefully yeah. you would, it, it would trend upward. Next one. How's that one for you? 1990s. <laughs> Look at those colors. <laughs> The church down there had a big situation, as a lot of small town churches do. It wasn't good. Um, I was actually a deacon in, in the church at the time, and it, it was shattering. Yeah. It, was, it was shattering, and uh, we didn't know what to do. So we started going to churches around town. We needed that church body and that support. And... Uh, we didn't find it in town right away. So we actually went to church and flag for a year. And it was Brandy and Clint who told us, this is no fun. Hmm. I don't know these people. You know, they're not my friends. And I don't get to go to youth group with them. I don't get to participate with them. And so that actually, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, a picture from First Baptist Church as hmm. we came back. And uh, we got into church here, and we got excited about it, and this church fed us. And uh, that was 1992 or something like that. That's when, that's the photo they put in the, remember those old-fashioned church directories that I think we still have? Yep. That, that's us. But as relationships change, those relationships were opportunities to grow. And so my uh, salvation story is not... Boom! It's like relationship, relationship, ooh, straight line, straight line, relationship, ooh, ooh. And in every single relationship that I had, God put in my path to help me become a better Christian. And so the next one, there it is now. And that's our, that's, that's our family now with my granddaughter, Bexley included. And so Brandy's with her husband, Mike, who you guys see all the time. And then's my son Clint, and that's our daughter Miranda with him and, and uh, Bexley. So that's my boring <laughs> story. Sorry, right. Fred. No, that's good. And I, if I can, I can't help myself. I'm, I'm a past, I'm a preacher. This is what I do. <laughs> um, I, I just got to comment a little bit on, um, I'm one of the boring testimonies. You know, I, I didn't rob a bank before I was three. Uh, um, most of the sin that God saved me from, he saved me from before I did it instead of after exactly, I did it. Exactly. You know, I, I didn't fall into like 
the drug drinking party scene, didn't get a bunch of girls pregnant and all that kind of stuff. God saved me from that because he grabbed me as a child. Right. That's my testimony. And you know, I'm, where I differ a little bit from you is I think that's an exciting testimony. Oh. <laughs> and, um, it, it's a... Sure, a lot nicer, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and where, I, where I want to kind of challenge you a little bit is, you know, and this is kind of a Southern Baptist thing. Uh, Jim, I don't think, would identify himself as Southern Baptist. He would identify, I'm a Christian. Um, but this is a Southern Baptist thing that I think that as a denomination we do wrong. You know, when we ask you to determine the authenticity of your faith, and we try to get you back to that day you first believed, I don't know about you, Jim. How much do you remember about the day that you actually invited Jesus into your heart? I mean, do you remember all the feelings? Do you remember all? Well, most of us don't. You know, when I was six years old, I don't remember a whole lot of the details of what happened that day I invited Jesus to my heart. Most of what I remember is my life since then. My, my, my relationship with Jesus since then. My journey with Jesus since then. And so that's my encouragement to you. Um, even those of you that became Christians at a very young age, when you're trying to evaluate your faith, don't try to remember what you were like when you were five. Who are you with Jesus right now? What's your relationship with him right now? What is he doing with you right now? When I asked Jim to give his testimony, I said, hey, Jim, I know you became a Christian when you were a kid. I want to know some highlights of what Jesus has done with you since then. That's your testimony. And you have that, and that is exciting. Every single Christian in here is an absolute miracle from God. Yeah. Uh, you are a saint that he's going to use to reign with him in heaven forever. Uh, taking dirty, rotten sinners like us and turning us into that, that should just absolutely blow us right out of our chairs. So I'm praising God for what he's done with you, and we absolutely adore your family. So God has done good things from this Winslow White uh, and, and just like you, I remember the names of the people that helped me along the way. Um, I remember the Susan Erickson, Sharon Knoll, Sandy Light, Laura Knatzer, uh, my mom, uh, Mrs. Gartman. I mean, all the way through till graduating high school. I remember every single impact, person that made an impact. So that's wonderful. All right, the next question I have for you, Jim, is uh, which spiritual disciplines are the most important to you and what specifically do you do to grow in your faith? This is to tell us about you, but this is also a little bit of challenge, what all of us need to be doing. But we want our deacons to be growing in their faith. We don't want anybody, no matter how old they are, to feel like, I have arrived. We want them to be growing. So what is it that you do to pursue that? All right, well, I'm up here with the microphone, and so I'm, I think I'm supposed to be able to tell you that I am a prayer warrior. Three hours a day minimum. <laughs> You know, that, I'm just not very good. I'm not very good at that. And a lot of my prayers, I end up falling asleep pretty quick. <laughs> so I, I'm not good at that. And I wish I could say, oh, an hour a day in Bible study. You know, I, I just, I, I don't, oh, well. I'm telling you, I, I, that's not how it is with me. Um, for me, it's, it's living each moment trying to stay in touch with the Holy Spirit. So, like, Lisa and I have started a devotion um, that we do, and it only takes three minutes, but it focuses me. And, you know, I'm one of those guys that go, squirrel! <laughs> and I'm like, hold it, I was talking to God. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, that happens to me. I, I, don't know, I don't know if you relate, but it's like, dead gummit. I'm supposed to be talking to God right now. But things that focus me on a daily as I try to live basis is what helps me. So that devotion helps me. The talk that Lisa and I have helps me. I love worship. I love teaching Bible study over there. But, you know, those focus me for this long. What focuses me is things that refocus me. Did that make any sense? <laughs> so things like that Christian music, having that Christian music on, you know, in the car or on your computer, and just you start, pretty soon you start singing along and your mind, oh, and trying to stay in touch with 
with the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, service. Someone needs your help. Go help them. And then when you help them, let them know, you know, hey, I'm glad Jesus gave me the time. Or slip something in there because that refocuses, um, refocuses me. And it's just more the daily lifestyle of trying to refocus. Mm. Helps me stay in touch with the Holy Spirit. Can I? Can I say Holy Spirit from the stage? <laughs> I mean, I mean, his leading. You guys can call the Holy Spirit. Some people, you know, comforter. Some people say my conscious. Some people call it in, intuition, what, whatever you want to say. I say it's the Holy Spirit. And the more I stay in touch with him, that's how I that's how I grow. And it's through relationships. It's through um, our relationship with people in this congregation. When we go out to eat. Guess what we talk about? Wholesome things, spiritual things. It's, they're not always scripture, mm -hmm. but usually it comes out that way. Mm -hmm. What are you doing on Saturday? Well, you know, I'm going over Ted's house to help him build. Is that an opportunity to be together? It is. And then uh, along came a thing called Promise Keepers. Did any of you get involved with Promise Keepers? That was an organization, a men's group that learned, uh, finally, it's told Christian men, you gotta, you got to learn to be Christian men. And, and it was like, it was eye-opening to see how much um, me as a Christian father, I was letting other people raise my kids. I was letting the TV have a huge impact on my kids. And, and it was like, okay, this has got to stop. Mm. And so it's, it's in those everyday moments of seeking and pursuing contact with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I know that's a weird answer, but that's, 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 that's how I grow. Answer. You know, he is our teacher. He is our guide. I, I can give the testimony that my conscience and my intuition are just stupid. <laughs> I just, if, it, if God left me to figure out anything from that inner, still, small voice, I'd lead myself astray all the time. And it's it's got to be the Holy Spirit, a divine God. I'm coming in and changing me. So, yeah, that's good. That's a good answer. Um, what in the life of the church or the ministry are you the most passionate about? What just really gets you excited about life in the church? Uh, this is going to, you know, it's relationships. It, it's relationships, families, mainly. How is your family? Which m means how is your marriage? Mm. And that's what, you know, Lisa and I have talked about, and that's what we like to do is, is work with people. And uh, I think the people in my class know we're always trying to bring it down to today. What's going on at my house now? You know, how is my relationship with my wife? How, how is my relationship with my kids? And I have a passion for families. We used to go to what was called family camp. And uh, when we went, we went with like three or four other families. So here I go again. There was um, the Tomic family. Some of you are familiar with them. And then we had the Sublets and uh, the Shires. Some of you will remember Sam and Madeline. And uh, we constantly hung out together. I mean, it wasn't on Sunday at services. We were together four or five times a week minimum because it edified our children and it edified us. And we, you know, we had dinner with each other. You know, we helped each other build our fences. But it it was constantly that Christ-centered relationship with others. And uh, I will say that I think technology is challenging us because the younger people today and, you know, it's all about, well, I'll just do this and this. And it's like, it's not the same as going to their house and actually being a part of each other's lives. Mm -hmm. did, I, did I say that right? Yeah. You know, being a part of each other's lives. And in that, Brandy, you got a slide, please? This is the simplest of verses. You all have it memorized. Most of you can sing it, right? You remember that campfire song? And so, no, I'm not going to sing it. Fred was like, <laughs> we're going to sing it. I'm like, no. How basic is this recipe? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all the other stuff's added. How hard, I mean, how hard is that? It's not like it's complicated. And then the next one is a great promise out of Jeremiah. It says, hey, when you seek me, you're going to find me. So you, gotta pro you got promises right along mm -hmm. with it. So 
I would say that my passion is to helping others and myself, because that's where I struggle, constantly seek these, these church and these uh, Christian, Christian relationships. And we, it was crazy. Last Sunday in class, we talked about this through the next one. You guys remember those? Some of you do, right? What's that stand for? What would Jesus do? How many of you ask yourself that on a daily basis? And I'm like, what happened to that? Because that's called seeking. That's called pursuing. If we want to seek the kingdom of God, we need to ask, hey, Jesus, help. What would you do, Jesus? It's, and it's kind of an easy thing to do, but I overlook it too much. And if I can help, uh, help all of us restore seeking as a part of our lives, that's what I would love to do. And what I hear you describing in several different ways on, on all the questions that keeps coming up, it's the idea of a church as an organism versus a church as an institution. You know, we, we did serious damage in our culture when we institutionalized the church. We made it a political force. We made it a organization where you come to a calendar of events, and then the idea is the rest of your life is whatever you want. Uh, no, we're an organism. We are a body, is the way Jesus describes it. It's where we're in this together. We're living life together um, throughout the week, throughout our conversations, throughout our home improvement projects. We're living life together as a church, and that is a real challenge that um, impacted you, and I just can't help but wonder how many people are missing out on what we're really supposed to be about. Because right. uh, I'll give God his one hour on Sunday and check mark, and then they're off doing their thing. Right. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, you're, you're preaching my sermon for me. This is good stuff. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, here, here's the last one. Um, aside from feeling called, uh, which I know that God had to do that for you, this is not the first time you've been nominated, but this year you feel like, you know what, I actually need to start paying attention. I, I think God's calling me this year. Um, so aside from being called to being a deacon, what draws you to want to serve as a deacon? What is it that appeals to you that God placed in your heart to where it made you feel called? Well, I've been dodging, <laughs> dodging this one for a long time. Um, some of you, maybe you're similar. When God calls you to something, you say, I'm not ready for that, or I'm not qualified for that, or... Or get Fred. Fred's so much better. Yeah. And so I've been dodging this a long time. So can I answer this with a story? Sure. Yeah? All right, if you have your Bibles, would you guys open up? Brandy, you want to you wanna switch over? Or your, or your technology? And let's go to 1 Samuel. Yeah. Now, I don't have a page number for you. I'm not very organized. <laughs> and I do have them. Ooh, I never thought I'd be up here like this. <laughs> I'll show you how old school I am. This is called a sticky. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what they are. <laughs> All right. And I'll do, the, Fred, you can correct me, but this is at a time in Israel when um, they were, you know, becoming a nation, and a lot of the people, you know, we get worldly, and they wanted a king, a real king. Somebody they could point to and say, he's the man. And uh, God was like, no, you don't. You got me. And they were persistent. I want a king. We want a king, you know. And so um, finally God relents. I don't know why. I mean, he knew what was going to happen. But he relented. And, he, and the, uh, the prophet at the time was Samuel. And here's what it says. Now a day before Saul's, my glasses are terrible. Now a day before Saul's continuing, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel, saying, About this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. Okay, and that's enough right there. But what did, what did God have Samuel do? He had him anoint Saul. Okay, now when God calls you for a task and you try to avoid it, like I do, 
and nothing happens, you're like, I got away with it. Score. Well, right here, the prophet came and anointed him. Now, how do you, how do you deny something like that? I mean, so God cho chose Saul. Then he appointed Saul. Then he anointed him. He said, you the king. Hmm. All right? That's, that's the way it is. All right, now let's skip over a little bit. Next slide, Brandy. So I'm going into chapter 10. Okay, verse 1. Then Samuel took the, took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? Now, if Fred called you in, he said, God has talked to me, and, you know, you're the one. You're going you're gonna to teach kindergarten. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say what you're going to say. You have your own decisions there, and... Uh, I'm not saying that Fred is, is God or anything, but in this situation, I don't see that Saul has a way out of it. <laughs> Do you guys see any way out of it for, for poor Saul? You know, he's probably saying, I don't want to be king. I don't know how to be king. Who am I? But he was chosen. All right. Now let's skip over one more slide, Brandy. Oh, that's a little one. Okay, this one is 1 Samuel chapter 10, 20. Through 22. And a disclaimer here this is not about gambling. Okay? <laughs> this is not something that approves gambling at First Baptist Church. <laughs> Thus Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. And then he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families, and the Matrite family was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he could not be found. Okay, so Saul already knew he was the king. But they went ahead and had this lot thing going on to make sure all the people understood this is not an accident. Okay, so now the people knew it wasn't an accident. They knew who Saul was because honestly, previously if you read, he was like a very tall, handsome, big dude. And so that's the kind of guy they wanted anyway, right? Verse 22, therefore they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come yet? So the Lord says, behold, he's right there. He's hiding in the baggage. <laughs> I mean, Saul couldn't get away. But you know what? He was hiding in his baggage. And if you look at some of the other translations, it will say he's hiding in his stuff. How many of us hide in our stuff? We don't want to do it. We ain't got the time. We're not good enough. Or how many of us make excuses? Oh, I had a terrible upbringing and I'm not ready yet. You know, I mean, because we have emotional baggage. You got emotional baggage? I do. You have spiritual baggage? You know, we all have stuff that we want to hide in when, when you get a calling. But right here, God knows where you're at. And God's saying, quit hiding. Step out of your baggage. Don't hide anymore. And uh, that's what happened to me. This time, when I was praying, I threw out a... <clears throat> you guys ever threw out a prayer fleece? <laughs> because you really don't want to do it. I mean, you know the story of Gideon, right? And you were like, I don't want to do this, so I'm going to throw out something that won't happen. And that way I won't have to do it. Well, this time it wasn't even 24 hours. Bong. <laughs> mm. I was like, shoot. <laughs> but I've been hiding in my baggage for a long time. So God told me quit hiding in the baggage, and he turned that f prayer fleece over on me. And I was like, doggone it, God. Okay, turn to Matthew, next one. I'm not going to read this one, but you guys know the parable of the talents in Matthew 25? Does everybody know it? Okay, and it talks about the uh, guy went away and he gave the guys who stayed talents. One of them, I think, five, five three, and um, ten, uh, ten, five, and... Five, five, two, and one. Okay, yeah. it's yeah. up there, but even with these glasses, I still can't even see that. 
Um, but the point is, at the end, God said to the one who had five and gave five and earned five more, well done. And the guy who had three and he earned three more, what did he say? Well done. Well done. The guy who he gave one, who buried it, what did he say? You wicked, evil servant, something like that. Holy crap. Hmm. Uh-oh, did I mess up? <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, and I, I went with the guy once, and he said, talent, that was a kind of money. Did you guys know that at the time? So they are talking about money in this parable. But what if the word talent, what if we actually for once use the literal, literal translation? What, for, what if this one time we said talent means talent? And God blessed Fred with talent to preach, talent to share the word, talent to witness. And so Fred has that talent. He better not bury it because he has it, and God gave it to him. Now, we can get into a whole talk on spiritual gifts and knowing what your gifts are and all of that, right? But that's not what I'm, I'm right now. I'm just saying God gave you talent, and it might not be talent to do what Fred does. And my son-in-law, Mike, it's crazy. He's got all this music going on. He's pushing buttons. Things are happening. You know, that is talent. But he's using it and he's to multiply God's kingdom. And for a long time, you know, I think I could have been a good deacon five years ago. I don't think I'll be as good of a deacon as I could be now, but um, I didn't use my talent correctly. And I'm hoping that you guys don't feel that way about your talent. Because there's a lot of ways here in this congregation and here in this town to use your talent. If your talent is painting, then paint for the Lord, you know? If your talent is communicating with other people, communicate for the Lord. If your talent is hospitality, after COVID's over, invite me over, and I'll take advantage of your hospitality. But we all have talent, and this scripture is saying, if you want, if you want to hear, well done, we got to use the talent. Don't bury the talent, and you've all got talent of some kind or another, and uh, <clears throat> I hope God has told me now I'll make a good deacon for you guys. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, you're good. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jim. Thank you so much for this church. Thank you for what you're doing in our church. Um, but God, if there's anybody in here that's missing out this morning, they're still trying to live life on their own and they're just stacking up regrets, please, God, save them from that. We know that Jesus already died for sin on a cross. He already rose again from the dead to give a new life. Please, God, now give them the, the insight and the passion to grab that for themselves and experience a new life that you offer. We love you, God. Thank you so much for loving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.